to our next speaker. Our next speaker, or the last speaker of the session, is Dr. Arindam Banerjee. So he's currently a professor uh, in computer science at the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana Champaign. So, uh, yeah, let's welcome Arindam. Thank you, Avi. Um, hello, everybody. So, last talk uh, of, the, uh, of the workshop and the day. So, I'll try to keep it lightweight, uh, no math. So, Essentially, I'm going to share our experience over the last couple of years on trying to work on an interesting problem uh, that you know, we are going to call broadly falls under uh, long range temporal prediction. And before I get started, I, I want to just acknowledge the workshop organizers for putting together such an amazing workshop um, that, that you know, we have all been enjoying. Right. All right. So, uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, uh, the group that I have, we have been working with uh, as part of our HDR uh, sub-seasonal climate forecasting project, uh, the co-PIs and the graduate students, Shiji and Shinyan, who have been driving a lot of the work with help from many of us. So, so what is this you know, long range temporal prediction problem, right? So um, the way this is different and unique is that you have data up to a certain time point T and you're trying to predict events at a certain time point, T plus capital T, where capital T is much, much larger than one, right? So, so you're, you're trying to predict the weather one month down the line. And I'm going to briefly discuss why this is challenging for both physics-based models and data-driven methods. And these pro problems fundamentally are in the low predictability regime. So you're not expecting R squares at you know 80% or something like that. You are, you are expecting like positive R square. You're ex expecting R square at 5%, 10%. That's, that's the operating regime we are talking about. So it's very different from where much of machine learning and other problems operate. And there are numerous real world examples. Uh, we are going to talk today primarily about uh, sub-seasonal uh, climate forecasting, which is really you know, forecasting temperature and precipitation um, in the two week to two month horizon, right? So. Um, so this is, uh, th you're not trying to predict accurate numbers, you're trying to predict statistics like the means and the medians and quantiles. And then SSF is an example of this long range temporal prediction with unique challenges. The relevant covariates, um, uh, they, they, they change based on the time uh, and you're of course operating in the low predictability regime. So, so let's just first start with a, a quick review of uh, short range temporal prediction. So, so short range temporal prediction es essentially is that you have data up to some point T and you are trying to the response Y, you're trying to predict Y T plus one. So the classical approach would be you, you do some autoregressive model or variations of the autoregressive model. Um, the, the, the next step in this development would be their actual exogenous variables or covariates like X's which you can use and it may be that the response Y impacts the X is in the next time step and X, you know, T minus one impacts the YT and so on and so forth, some su suitable dependency structure. Um, so, so, so then these come in. Probably the most popular form of, of this are, uh, are models involving state variables or some sort of a latent state dynamics. So the common examples of these are hidden Markov models, Kalman filters and all its variations like ensemble Kalman filters for DVAR many variations of data assimilation and so on. So you, you try to capture some latent state dynamics and those states have an impact on what you're observing. And then the deep learning models over the last five, seven years, autoregressive models, CNN, RNNs, transformers, neural differential equations, all of these have been coming up. Uh, uh, so, and, and the deep learning models can be categorized into the other three that we have just talked about. So this is also, remember that this is all development for the short range where you're trying to predict T plus one or T plus two, three up to five, maybe that, that sort of a scenario. What we are talking about is long range temporal prediction. So where you have data up to point T and you are trying to predict Y T plus capital T. So you are trying to predict the weather 30 days down the line, right? One of the main points I want to make in this talk is this, is that most of the existing machinery breaks down for these problems. So the state variable models of these latent state dynamics, Kalman filters, HMMs, variations, they are basically now operating without data. So they reach a stationary, if they run them forward, the observations have stopped. So you're running basically a statistical model forward 
they will reach a stationary distribution with humongously large uncertainty, right? If you are using deep learning, what typically happens is this is extremely low predictability regime. During the training, you get good results probably, but then it's overfitting and this poor out of sample performance. And then the dynamical models, this is really a long range initial condition run. You initialize the model at T and you run it forward. Um, so there's a heavy dependence on the initial condition, potential chaotic behavior. This is why you know, numerical weather prediction models are not useful at the sub-seasonal level, because if you run them that, that much forward, they, they don't have much predictability left. So this is, a, this is a different kind of a problem, right? So, and the existing solution techniques that we have, and we have been trying to use those, it's been very difficult to sort of try to make them work in this, this scenario. So this is sort of one of the main messages uh, that I, I think we need to start very carefully thinking about. And this is also sort of an area where, uh, where we need to start understanding what would work in this scenario. So, so one specific example, you, know, you, you may have heard that for sub-seasonal prediction, people say that, oh, you know, soil moisture will have an impact on sub-seasonal forecast. So that's a, that's a mechanistic understanding. It's, it's more complex because it'll be a superposition of multiple effects like this, but we have to learn what, what impact you have in the long range and probably it could be a superposition of multiple effects. So I'm going to now come back to sub-seasonal sort of forecasting and to make things more concrete. Uh, so sub-seasonal forecasting there has been over the last 10 years, a lot of effort put in to try to popularize this problem because it's fundamentally very hard. Two National Academy reports have been released on this. I like this picture, which shows that subseasonal is, the, is the, uh, the blue markers, and it shows that it has wide ranging applications. And this is just outside the weather regime, the numerical weather for prediction regime. And this is where things start uh, breaking down. And we are still differentiating it with the seasonal or the uh, you know, decadal pred predictions over here. We will focus on the subseasonal only for today's talk. Um, operational centers do release uh, uh, seasonal, sub-seasonal forecasts. So this is, you know, I pulled it out like probably yesterday. This is, this is what they have released on July 31st. So this is, the, this is the outlook on temperature and precipitation over the next month, over, over August really this month. Uh, and operational uh, forecast uh, agencies do do this, but they are also the ones that are encouraging more people to get involved in this problem. Uh, because the accuracies are not very good. They are organizing various kinds of competitions in order to improve the state of the art. So why is this hard, right? So, so this is a very sort of a cartoon of, you know, you know what the forecast skill at various levels. So weather forecasts, we, we know that up to a week it is okay, but then it drops. Uh, seasonal forecasts are, are moderately fairly accurate, but sub-seasonal forecast is one of the more difficult ones. And again, staying with cartoons, the, the reason that's the case is that if you look at the memory of the three main systems involved in, in this uh, setup, the atmosphere, land, and the ocean, uh, the, the weather is primarily determined by the atmosphere, right? So, so you, you do good atmospheric models, you're, you're in good shape. So you, you do data assimilation, that's the state of the art, right? Ensemble Kalman filters and so on. In the seasonal range, ocean has the most memory. So, so ocean, if you're focusing on ocean using the ocean variables correctly, you are going to get both statistical and dynamical models probably are going to be doing okay. Uh, the, the, the two week to, you know, this, this few weeks out, all three of them have a little bit of memory. Land has a say, atmosphere maybe has a lingering say, ocean is starting to ramp up and so on. So this is where many different processes are active and they're interacting with each other. And there's a superposition, which makes the sub-seasonal a really interesting problem and a challenging problem to work on. Uh, so I'm going to just do a very quick recap of some past work we have done. This was actually published in uh, AAAI this year, which is this big AI conference. Uh, and we have released the data sets and the software and everything is in GitHub. So, so if you want to sort of test out our system, uh, you will be able to do it. What we essentially did is that we put together a deep, large data set with covariates from land, ocean, atmosphere, and we tried to predict you know, two meter temperature in the week three, week four out. So what I mean by that is that you have data till end July, then you are trying to predict the last two weeks of August. Right, so the average temperature in the last two weeks of August. Um, so what we found, and I'm really giving an upshot, is that we, we probably tried like 10, 12 different machine learning models and a bunch of baselines. That machine learning models do sort of okay. They, they're, they're mildly able to beat baselines. They're, they're able to do a little bit better than sort of basic climatological baselines like 
damp persistence or using just least square using NAO and El Nino. So, so these kinds of simple baselines, uh, a method like XGBoost or Lasso will be able to outperform. We also developed some deep learning models. I'm not going to get into the details of this, but it, it also did quite okay. Right, and some other models didn't do so well and so on and so forth. So, so we have a very detailed uh, uh, report and paper on, on this and what we found. Um, uh, but but let's, let's take an example. So, so let's focus on Montana, for, for example. And, and what we found is that, well, Lasso does pretty poorly. And you know, over here, this multi-LLR model, XGBoost, they're all sort of struggling. Um, uh, probably this deep learning model is doing well over here. This is in Montana. And we'll, we'll talk about these things in a bit more detail because we really dug in and we started understanding where are the errors being made and why are we making these errors, right? So, but one of the bigger questions that came out is our climate colleagues were saying, we cannot just compare machine learning models. We have to compare them with climate models just as a, just as a sort of a model intercomparison project in a, in a small scale. So what I'm going to talk about today more uh, in, in, in the, probably the next 10 minutes is what we found when we compare these results uh, to climate, climate models in the subseasonal uh, timeframe. So we were sort of starting to look for you know, what we can use for the subseasonal and then our colleagues uh, at COLA and GMU, they had run this project called the SubX, which is basically climate models in, in the subseasonal timeframe. So this was, this was fantastic. They had you know, published this paper in 2019, the data and everything is available. So we pulled a couple of models from there, the, the GMAO model. So this is the NASA global modeling and assimilation model and the NCEPS uh, climate forecasting so CFS V2, which is also quite popular and widely used. So we are going to sort of compare the machine learning models with these two climate models in the sub-seasonal forecasting problem. Uh, one thing I want us to note is that the forecast range, so these are you know, climate models are run as hindcast, so about 16 years, and then the forecast of three years. So this forecast range for GMAO and NCEP are slightly different. So when we compared the machine learning models, we did the comparison, we had to do the comparison separately because this is sort of the test set for, for the machine learning models in, in, in that case. It's easy for machine learning models to sort of adjust to these timeframes. So I'm, I'm going to show the GMAO and NCEP models separately. All right, so the main takeaway, so sort of the, the high level picture. So what I'm showing over here is a spatial R squared distribution, like sort of some measure of accuracy, right? Higher is better. And I'm showing the distribution, you know, uh, it's, it's a spatial R squared. So what you find is that the ML models like XGBoost, Lasso, and AutoKNN, I'm, I'm talking R squared. So they basically have, they're they all sort of almost overlapping, right? So they don't have a lot of, they have a little bit of negative R squared, but not a lot, but they have also a little bit of positive R squared, right? The deep learning model, the encoder FNN. Uh, uh, so so you, you can see that it sometimes completely messes up. It gets large negative R squares, right? Sometimes it completely messes up and gets large negative R squared. But also on the positive side, it actually outperforms these conservative models, the XGBoost, Lasso, AutoKNN models, which are sort of non-committal on either side, right? So it's just playing safe uh, throughout. So, so, so the deep learning model actually outperforms then on when it, when it does well, it does really well. And the climate model GMAO also have a, has a more sort of a similar behavior that when the climate model fails, it, it fails disastrously in the forecast, but, but when it does well, it actually does really well, right? So it, it definitely outperforms this XGBoost Lasso auto opinion model. Now, this is a story you're going to miss if you just take the average R square and report, and, and we do report that. And of course, the conservative models are going to come out looking better because these negative numbers you know, will pull down the average for the climate model uh, and, and, the, and the deep learning model because they, their average is just, just going to go down, right? So, but you understand it's a bit more nuanced than that, right? There are situations where they are getting a certain process right and they're nailing the prediction. And we will see a bit more of, of this. And then you know, you can, we have studied this using QQ plots as well. Uh, so the same story plays out. Uh, if you look at, uh, look at the com comparison with NCEF, the exact numbers are different, but qualitatively the plots are similar, right? So the conservative machine learning models, XGBoost, Lasso, AutoPain, and sort of, they are always non-committal. They don't, they don't like go too much in the positive or negative R square range, but the climate model and the ML, uh, the deep learning models actually do, do, uh, uh, do that. All right, so, um, 
So I'm going to get into a bit more of the details of these results, just, just hammering this point home, is that if you average this over time, right, and you look at the spatial sort of performance, and the temporal R squared, the, the time series in compute, the cosine similarity of sorts, GMO looks bad because of those negative R squared that we saw, right? So, and, and as I'm saying that this does not completely tell you the picture because they have average and they had bad stretches, that's why they are looking so bad. Now the XGBoost last one, auto KNN, they're sort of, they're not too red, not too, uh, green, whereas encoder FN. Now again, let's go back to Man Montana, which was our example. So if you look at Montana again, XGBoost and Lasso and AutoKN in both are reddish. They are not doing, they, are, they have negative R square over here. GMAO, the climate model is actually getting a green over there. And the deep learning model is actually getting a green over there. So they, they are probably, so there's probably some process which affects the temperature in Montana. You know, it may be the jet stream, it may be polar vortex, something else. And the GMO model is definitely capturing it. Probably the deep learning model is, uh, is, is uh, figuring out to some extent, and that's why it's doing well over there. Uh, but there are stretches where it's, uh, where it's not doing so well. And that's the same storyline plays out in the comparison with NCEP. So I, I don't have anything more to say about the NCEP results. It's qualitatively similar. L let's take an anecdotal example of how this plays out. So this is a specific sort of time frame, March, March of 2018. You may remember, or you can look up, there was an extreme strong cold spell that happened. This is the ground truth, right? So, so the real temperature really dipped in Montana, Dakotas, you know, uh, Wyoming and Nebraska and so on and so forth. So GMO essentially gets the intensity that it's going to, there's a cold wave going to ha happen. And understand this is two weeks out, right? So this is, this is way out, two, uh, this is weeks three and four. So it's actually saying that there is a cold wave going to happen. Whereas the machine learning models are sort of non-committal. They're, they're saying, ah, it's going to be a little cold. I mean, it's, it's the Dakotas and so on and so forth. So these are the bits the process-based model gets right. Whereas a machine learning model, at least these ones are hesitant. But it's also true that you can find these examples where you know, January 2020 was pretty warm. Uh, uh, and then GMO forecast just says, oh, there's going to be a cold spell. Uh, and, and it gets it wrong. This is where it's getting picking up the negative R squares. Um, uh, whereas XGBoost is again sort of non-committal. It's, it's not getting, getting the intensity right, but it gets away with a slightly better R square because of these kinds of prediction. So the story is a, is a bit more nuanced is the point I'm making. So, so we should not look at aggregate R squares or accuracies because these are spatiotemporal problems and there, there are processes going on over here. So we want to keep be mindful of that. All right, so I'm going to sort of briefly study just the ML models in terms of their regional and tail error performance. And we are focusing on the Western contiguous US. Um, um, and, and so the results uh, sort of sort of key takeaways so what we are plotting over here on the, on the X axis, we are plotting the response Y, the thing that we are trying to model. And on the, on the, on the Y axis, I'm plotting the error, right? So this is, uh, so, so we, are, we are trying to study now, one thing that pops out is that the, 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 the blue one is the West North Central region. These are the Dakotas and Wyoming and, and, and Montana and, and Nebraska. So, so our largest RMSCs are coming from that region for the ML models, right? For the other regions, it's, it's reasonable. I mean, it's not, not a complete train wreck, but the largest errors are coming from, from, from this region, right? The second one, which you may have already noticed is that when y is larger in absolute magnitude, our errors are larger. This should not happen. Like we are fitting a regression model, your y increases, your error increases. This happens in heteroscedastic problems. So this is a bit bothersome. Uh, I, mean, I mean, and particularly if you see that y is larger in negative, meaning that these are the cold spells, right? So these are the cold waves and the cold waves that are happening in this region on this is the tail distribution and the machine learning models are struggling in the tail distribution, all of them, XGBoost, Lasso, and AutoKNN, right? So, so they get large errors on the tail. So, so if you need a good example of machine learning models failing on properly modeling the tails, you, you, can, you can pick up this example because we have looked at this very carefully and this is showing up, right? And, and then the other thing to realize in, in the, in, in, the deep learning models, actually it's not, it's doing a bit better on the tails. It's, it's not like this, you know, as your Y increases, your error increases. That does not quite happen in the deep learning models. They are sort of holding their ground to, to some degree, but you know, their RMSs are large. 
So, so this plot actually gives you a bunch of research directions that, that one can go forward. Uh, ML models are performing poorly on the tails. Their RMSs are the largest when Y is the largest. This is the cold spells, so those, those extreme, extreme cold uh, regions. So, so, so this really sort of calls for, we need to pay attention to this and find directions, maybe model the tail separately, maybe do a process-based model for the tails and something like that. Some research needs to happen in this direction. And then the West North Central region seems to be the most challenging, right? So, and that may be because, you know, the jet stream fluctuate, there are other processes going on that the ML models are not quite picking up. Maybe the deep learning is picking up, picking up to some extent, uh, but, but that's a region of interest. And California seems pretty easy for, for these models. I mean, it just looks at Pacific SST and maybe that's, that almost takes you there and so on. So, so the last bit that we did um, uh, um, uh, in, in this context was that we said, okay, so we do need to combine the ML and climate models, uh, but we did something very simple as a first cut. We said that we are going to take the climate model output. We are going to take the climate model output and use it as a covariate um, uh, in, in the machine learning model. So let's say XGBoost, Lasso, whatever it is that you're picking. Um, uh, so what we found was that if you, know, if you, if you look at this is XGBoost without the GMAO forecasts. So if you look at you know, Nebraska, Right, so if you, if you look at the Dakotas, you know, North Dakota, and then we added the climate forecasts as a covariate, you see North Dakota looks better, the Dakotas look better, Nebraska looks much greener and so on and so forth. So, so the machine learning model is realizing, you know what, this is actually a good predictor of whatever it is that I'm being asked to predict. Now, this is an extreme weak example of combining physics and machine learning. We are just taking the output but we are hoping that we'll be able to design more sophisticated versions of this idea going forward. Uh, uh, these climate models are not easy to design or play with, uh, but, but we are, we, this is something we will be looking into just in terms of the numerics, right? Um, so, so XGBoost without the GMAO covariate get, gives you, you know, some, some sort of an accuracy or R squared. And then with, with GMAO, just you have added just one more covariate and you have, you know, gazillions of covariates coming from ocean, atmosphere, and land, you just get a serious bump, right? So, and same for NCEP, uh, both for the mean and the median, you get slightly larger bump on the median, uh, so, so, so to say. And we did something similar uh, uh, with, with Lasso. And again, uh, I mean, you, we added this as a covariate, and you can see that this is, this is all green now with the thing. So this is sort of more a direction that we want to go uh, uh, and it is looking very promising. So these are our best results actually currently once, once, we, once we have combined them and they're, they're looking pretty promising. So, okay, so to wrap up, um, uh, I talked about this long range temporal prediction problem and some of us are spending time thinking and it's really challenging for both physics-based and data-driven methods because your intuition of you know, ensemble Kalman filters and, and, and data assimilation that sort of falls apart because your data has stopped. You're going out one month and you're trying to predict something and it is the low predictability regime. So it's a, it's a potentially very good use case for KGML, which is why we are trying to release the data sets, a lot of details and you can look up that web page and we are, we are happy to respond to questions and so on. And then I talked a little bit about the subseasonal forecasting you're making some progress. There, there is, we, we did a very fine grained data analysis uh, and it shows different inductive biases for the different methods. The future work really will be to combine uh, uh, these models and see how things go. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks for the great talk. Uh, so, um, so we have a few questions here. So the first question is, uh, you mentioned at the beginning, you mentioned about the overfeeding in the context of deep learning. I think, especially compared to uh, this uh, existing physical model. So is there any theories or uh, any solid empirical work for, uh, for better understanding this out of sample performance for machine learning models? Right. Um, uh, so so there, there is not much theory. Some I mean, folks are trying to do this. So, so you have to understand, I mean, I also work on core machine learning. And one of the exciting things that has happened is that this notion of being in the interpolation regime where, where you are perfectly fitting the training data. Now in low predictability regimes, uh, this is, does not give you a good sense of your future performance. So a simple experiment you can set up is take the MNIST data, data set, the standard toy data set, take like make 50% of the labels random, right? 
So just randomly change 50% of the labels and train your deep net. It'll perfectly fit that data set, right? It'll perfectly fit that data set. Now, from that, can you say anything about how it will perform in the future? You may say that, oh, I'm going to get perfect. You cannot get perfect performance. Your accuracy cannot be more than 50%. So this is a very toy example. And you know, there are papers being written on this. Other people have written, we have written papers on this. So, so, so that's your sandbox to start studying this effect. Uh, that, 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 that's a low predictability regime problem because your accuracy can be at most 50%. There's work to be done. I, I don't think, yeah. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, yeah, another question is, uh, so I think uh, in the experiment part, you, you showed that uh, machine learning models perform relatively uh, worse uh, in, uh, for handling the tails. Uh, so does that mean uh, compared to those Earth system models that machine learning more, models more or less filter out some extremes as like potential outliers? And if so, uh, if, if this uh, really happens, are there any theoretical guarantees uh, on these things? So, uh, so this is the example of the tail model where your Y is extreme cold and your RMSE is extremely high. This is, you know, this is a beautiful plot because it's showing that it, this should not happen. This, this curve should be flat, right? So your error should not depend on the value of Y, right? So this, is, this happens when you have heteroscedasticity. Uh, you know, so we are really talking of future directions here. Uh, so one possibility, may, maybe the tails need to be modeled separately, but you need to know when a tail will happen, right? So, so there are two things. One is probably a binary classification problem. Am I going to see a tail, a cold spell heat wave in the next month? And then if that happens, you know, I train a separate model and that gets activated over there. But this is, you know, we are still thinking about this. I'm, I'm speculating at this point. Any ideas you have, we'll be happy to discuss about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, so we'll end up here because of the time, but uh, if you have time, I mean, uh, there are still a few questions left on Slido. So if you have a chance, you can.